Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. I'm speaking with Mark Germain and Mike Litvin. Hi, Jonah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we are just kind of hanging out and chatting. Uh, Mark um, came through Santa Fe for the High Desert Human Design Spring Fling, and he couldn't stay away. He's couldn't stay back. away. No, yeah. already back. Just when I thought I got out, you dragged me back in. <laughs> So uh, he, he left early and came back. <laughs> <laughs> did I leave? That's the question. But did he ever really leave? We were yeah. all just just talking about him. But anyway, he's here now, and um, we were just, I was just chatting with Mike. We were talking a little bit about the transits. Mark, you said we're not going to like your take on the transits. Why is that? Um, I'm just I. The transits are interesting. It it is the program's way of conditioning the not self mind to homogenize it, um, especially when decisions are being made from the mind based on, ooh, this transit's here, I'm gonna do this, mm. or this transit's here, it becomes very mental. That's the potential, at least. I mean, the transits can be a benefit if it's through you operating correctly through strategy and authority, then the transits, the frequency behind that something that maybe could be beneficial in some way but if you're trying to manipulate it or use it or use it in some kind of mental way hmm. uh, to determine something um, because that would then lead to probably mental decision making on some level to whatever degree and, uh, and not rely on one strategy and authority because you're trying to potentially uh, manipulate things. Trying to game the system a game little bit. The, yeah, exactly. Okay. So that's why I'm a little leery about that. Sometimes I'll look at it back uh, in hindsight, or I'll look at the number day, usually sometimes. If I'm going to look at the transits, I'll look at that. Um, yeah, someone asked me if we did the last High Desert Human Design on purpose during the nodal shift. And if we did it on purpose at the very end of the quarter and all this, and oh. it, it wasn't really the case. Uh, we did it for logistical reasons, but then happened to check. Mm -hmm. However, this year, so the first year we did it in the quarter of duality. For human, High Desert Human Design Conference 2, we did it in civilization. And then people were saying, let's do it a little later. And it's kind of just, they weren't really saying let's do it in the quarter of duality, but that's what it kind of amounted to was mm -hmm. everything's just so busy in the summer and so crazy yeah. and the prices are so high and it's so active. Let's do it a little later in the year when it's more mellow and we have mm -hmm. more one-on-one -on -one time. It's emergent. Like so, we're, we're, we're parts of like, it's not necessarily the mind rationalizing to act in accordance with the program, but the program speaks through everything, through the flowers and the trees and the seasons. And well, if you're living yeah. naturally with your body as an extension of the earth, which is the whole point, then your body's also going to represent the, the seasons in terms of what decisions it wants to make. Yeah. Well, a duality, you know, is all about, you know, relationships. So we're all relating, learning how to relate with oneself. We're learning to relate with the other, especially in mechanics. So, you know, having something in that background frequency can be uh, accentuate that. Yeah, and it's, it's not like we're, you know, oh, let's do it. But see, there's also an interesting question of um, how do you choose when to set the, the High Desert Human Design event? I mean, there are a lot of logistical concerns that are really just path of least resistance. And then if somebody checks and says, well, could we move it a week? And I go, ah, uh, it's not going to work. Or I go... Ah, okay, you know, or mm -hmm, let's move it, you know. It's kind of one of those yeah. things, you know, pe people like to say that the sacral response, if it's not a no, if it's not a hell yeah, then it's a no. Mm. And I don't think that's always the case. I think sometimes it's just the path of least resistance. It's yeah. just, uh, you know, for it to go against the path of least resistance, I mean, I don't know if it ever does, really. I mean, I mean, it's it's interesting. The more it never I, could, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of just the sacral is it's, going with the flow of life. Well, it's, that's yeah, what I think. Yeah, it's a, go ahead. I was just going to say it's the tendency of nature. And to me, that's like something I've come to just as a projector and realizing the difference of projector is you're seeing the tendency of nature from without. You're not feeling the tendency of nature, but in not being awash in the tendency of nature, speaking through your own body, you get to be witness to it. Like you're still you're still an extension of the earth, whatever, in your own way as a projector, but you also get to see kind of outside of the river where the river is going. And it's like each generator is a part of the river. Each generator like is a river. 
and they're with that path of least resistance. Yeah. They're with that tendency of nature. That consistent life force energy that the sacral provides. So exactly. That which the, which projectors or non non uh, sacral people have. So they're the ones who are learning about life. You could see it at, as a potential observer and witness, and to see what life is really about is really the lesson for the non sacral more than any. Yeah, and, exactly. Well, and if you think about some of the metaphors or similes that Ra uses for the generator of even the, I mean, I, he's used a number of, of them, but I, I think about um, the sacral response of it's, it's, it's either responding or it isn't. And it's almost like you're either hitting a drum and you're getting a sound or hitting a bell mm -hmm. and you're getting a sound or you're not. And when you don't get a sound, when you don't get a response, it's just kind of, it's not making that energy available. It's not making that sound available. All the generators are here getting hit by life mm -hmm. and either responding mm -hmm. or not. Right. And, uh, and sometimes they are responding, but the mind is almost like, no, 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 don't respond. Or, or it's not. responding from the mind, you know. It's, sure. It's, yeah. Well, I, I love, you know, I actually, I love Freud's description of um, the unconscious like a horse and the conscious is the... The, the rider mm. and the horse is going one way and the mind the, the the conscious mind is kind of hitting it and saying no 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 go this way go that way and there are so many generators who are vegetarian but they're responding to eating meat and saying no 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 I'm vegetarian or right. they're you know they're gay but they're responding you know they're 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 responding to something their mind won't let them have because of the guilt and the conditioning and because of the vice grip and so anyway it just as a projector it's not that that projectors don't have Problems, obviously they do, and there's not self problems as well. That's but, <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, talk to a three five projector. And see what but I guess, you are. but it's a different. It, yeah, that's my joke. But it's a different. It's a different nature of problem because the problem of the generator is always the problem of not knowing themselves, mm -hmm. and the problem of the projector is the bitterness from not being recognized, from not being around the right people, and, right. and so on, and other things. Maybe, maybe, you know, you might be able to to add to that. But I guess I was just trying to say that if we use the metaphor of the generators as what is being, you know, they are the drums being hit and they are the cellos and violins mm -hmm. being played and all of these instruments that are meant to respond. Yeah. And when they're operating in a very clean frequency out of response, um, they're basically, you know, they're putting out a very clean frequency mm -hmm. and, and things yeah. are coming to them and it's, it's basically... The, the projectors, their clean frequency is different. It's like, it's like a clean surgical frequency. It's mm -hmm. not like a clean, like the, the generator's aura really makes up the aura of the world. Yeah. That's what Ra would always say is that if you change the generator, you change the world. They create the world by being alive. Yes, it's the and life force think, energy. And I think you need to change enough projectors to help enough generators. Sure. It's yeah. a it's a chicken egg kind of thing in a way. There has to be some kind of balance because I think the world really needs projectors to really help guide. But they're, from my take, are some of the most challenged mm -hmm. because the world expects something so different from you know what they truly are to what they expect them to be. Right. So that that and that creates a lot of mental dilemmas for the the projector or other non sacrals too but it's a little different for uh, a projector versus a generator a generator can fake their way through a lot of, of through life a little bit uh in terms of working and stuff like that they have a lot of challenges in in their own right it's, a, it's just di very different well the generator oftentimes we don't see a lot of generators uh, percentage-wise coming into human design as much as we see. I, I would say projectors are the most, maybe reflectors also, but uh, you don't see a lot of manifestors usually. I mean, Ra talked about how few manifestors were. And they then like to be taught. They don't like to be taught. That's yeah, they, yeah, they, they want to be the ones in charge and so on. But you see... Um, but what you see is a lot of projectors, and I think it's because they're wanting to understand the system. With generators, it's like... They can be miserable and frustrated at a job they hate and a relationship they hate, all this stuff, but they have their little thing, which is their kind of not self um, version of the Holy Grail, whether it's watching the sports game on Monday night yeah. or hanging out and having beers or going to take the, you know, the me time or the... That sounds they, a little 40th temple right now, too. Oh, okay. Right? 
The in the forty gate gate forty as the, yeah as the uh, right that's a good point in the global cycles gate forty is the temple forty is aloneness and so 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 the love of work for the other yeah well and right as well yeah that's that's Get true your masturbation and denial <laughs> so they have on. their VR headset <laughs> they have their pornography <laughs> there they have their well because there's a lot of stand-ins for what the possibility is the stand-in for satisfaction is orgasm I mean. Ra did say orgasm is the greatest metaphor for what satisfaction is, but there's the the literal orgasm that ultimately ends up not being satisfying mm. if it's overdone, mm -hmm. or or maybe is the sort of um, it's the thing that that you get as a little bit of a, you know as as a sort of um, token. It's like the token satisfaction that you gain. All right, so we have a guest, a surprise oh, okay. guest. <laughs> cool. Hi. Amy Evans. Say hello, hey. everyone. Hello. We're audio only. Hi, nice Hi. to meet you. Mark. Here, come have Good a seat. See you, come have a seat. So we were just talking about generators. Now we have two generators and two projectors. We have even the odds. Well, you're a manifesting generator. Or a generator with manifesting potential. But we were talking about satisfaction <laughs> right. with the generator and how how so many generators don't get into human design because they have just enough satisfaction to not blow their brains yeah. out, basically. And, well, and they have so much more historical precedent, like so much more instruction because they've always been around. Projectors don't have as much cultural resource to draw from in terms of how to be because they've only been around since the 1700s. So there's only so many exemplars. Well, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, that that's it. It's just like, because even though we were all seven-centered beings and now we're not or whatever, it's like the generator can still glean things from humanity's past in the way that a projector can't. Mm -hmm. The projector is so new that there's things that are, you know, you know there's, there's um, yeah, there's less precedent. There's less precedent for how to yeah. be an effective projector. Yeah, I, I was just going to piggyback on what you said, just say it a little differently, is that the generator is wired in a in a more traditional way to deal with the not self world better than a projector yeah by far i mean they that's what i meant by they could fake it in a way is yeah because like jonah said they get enough little bits of satisfaction here they can live a predominantly frustrating life and plow through some stuff because they have the life force energy to do that although sometimes they could say enough's enough and just quit but um but they can endure that where I find the projectors they can endure, but it comes at such a great cost that mm -hmm. and they end up usually not enduring. Uh, so, um, but they're so different. Yeah, you know, it's very I, different. I really like uh, so it's really interesting how starting and so you're talking about in the late 1700s when pro projectors emerged. Um, before then, there were really just manifestors, generators, and reflectors. And so generators were around 90%. Manifestors were still a very small amount. Um, uh, you know, it's not like... it's So And I'm guessing here we don't exactly know because we don't have a body graph for the seven-centered being. But the point is, historically, if we look at all of civilization and pre-civilization leading up to the modern era, post-1781, mm. what we find is really the manifestor-generator dichotomy. And there are three theorists who all emerged uh, in the cross of planning era who have really theorized this extremely well. And they are Hegel, Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, mm. and Jacques Lacan. All mm. three of them worked extensively on the master-slave dialectic. Mm. And what they basically looked at, uh, I'll just kind of use the Lacan version because he's the most recent one, and, and he draws heavily from both Hegel and Nietzsche, um, what they looked at was the masters who essentially were in charge of things. Of course, for Nietzsche, there's the resentment uh, that people have towards the master. That's the generator's frustration and resentment towards um, the kind of manifester. But what Lacan found was that actually in his, in his formulas, he, he came up with these, these wonderful formulas where he shows that the master has given up all pleasure. And that the master is really alienated mm. from the world and mm. alienated from the commonality of... It's actually much more enjoyable, much more satisfying. Mm. And, I mean, I think he even uses the word satisfaction. He at least uses the word pleasure. Yeah. That the master has given up the search for pleasure and instead they're simply trying to have an impact historically. Yes. Right, right. And the slaves 
um, they get to actually exclude the master from their songs and dances and drinking and sexuality and all of the kind of huddled masses of warm bodies that just pile on each other and are all connected to each other and feel essentially this commonality mm. that the master can never know because they've been mm -hmm. forever shunned and alienated. And if that isn't a description of the manifestor, I don't know what is. Mm. Now, because manifestors report this, they report feeling so alienated, so rejected, so, you know, it's kind of going to dinner with the manifestor can be like going to dinner with the boss. You feel a little bit on edge. Mm. You know, you feel a little bit like, okay, well, we have to put on a good show for the boss now. Then the boss leaves and everybody finally relaxes. I mean, mm. Ross said he lectured to a room full of manifestors and they were the most uptight, repressed people in the world. He would never do it again. They all had a, a stick somewhere it shouldn't be, you know? Mm. Everyone was so strict and so severe and so intense and mm. so... And, you know, um, the projector is not like that. The projector is the boss that can actually truly connect with you and can connect with you in the deepest way that you've never been connected with ever before. Mm. They can make generators feel so special like they're the only person in the room. You know, Ra loved to laugh about the undefined throat generator and how addicted to the projector they can be because they finally someone's paying attention to me. And not mm. only are they paying attention to me, they're burrowing deep inside me and mm. seeing me for who I really am. And you don't get that with the manifester. The manifester doesn't care who you are. Mm. They care about the impact they're having. Mm. They care about if you're getting in their way or not. That's the classic dichotomy, mm. the master-slave dichotomy. We kind of, it, it, you know, in, in some way the projector is replacing the master, but they're not just being a master, they're overturning the whole dichotomy. Now, mm. I, I don't want to confuse, of course, with fourth color master and all of that, um, which I know you, you, you are, right? No, you're hope, you're hope, you're the guru. You're the guru. I love the anti-theist yeah. guru. Yeah, I, I love the, the keynotes that Ra gives us for the different colors. You know, I'm the priest. Uh, we have a couple of priests and a guru here. So. But anyway, that's just kind of a little side, side note about how there really is a lot of theorizing in the world of philosophy about the master-slave dialectic. They don't know that they're talking about the manifestor-generator dialectic. Mm. They don't necessarily understand that. Um, and you see generators rise up to positions of power, of mastery, and then they don't, you know, sure, they might, they might rise up to that position, but they can't really fill the shoes in that way. Right. Um, and then the, the projector doesn't fill the shoes in that old school way either. The projector fills the shoes in a, a very different way. I mean, they... It's something new. Yeah. It's like, so you talked about how, like, there's the... It's really a trade-off, like, the fact that the master can never appreciate the slave um, satisfaction or whatever. The, the, the slave, whatever, the worker can know peace... It's just not the point for them. They don't feel it as intensely as a satisfaction. It's more rarefied. You know, Aristophanes is writing his play Peace in 400 BC or whatever, at the time when there were only generators, manifestors, and reflectors. And like you said, an even crazier disproportionality. If there were 90% generators and still only 9% manifestors. And you've also talked before about the manifestor, the, the strategy of the manifestor informing as being baseline in some way there's also like a baseline of anger there's something universal about anger and there's something even more universal about surprise and disappointment everyone mm -hmm. feels these things and it's like the more rare the type the more like fundamental in the background these signatures are and the more you know you become a generator and they, they become less the point and then the projector is this weird even newer thing for whom none of these things are the point right not surprise nor satisfaction nor peace right and yet peace remains relatively rarefied just because it is still the point for a more of a minority of people because there's half as many manifestors as there are projectors so the people mm -hmm. that really appreciate peace even though we can all kind of experience that in the same way we can all kind of experience anger um is is still something that you have to I don't know. I think that it has to do, especially for, you know, for the manifestors and reflectors, the fact that they're feeling the cosmos first and feeling the people who are in the room with them second. Mm -hmm. That's how delicate it is, that thing that they're feeling. It has to be cut off from whoever's around in order to really feel it with the sensitivity that they do. That's a really good point, that the, projectors, the projector is the, 
you know, before it was a division between the generators being the only types that feel each other first right. in the cosmos second. Yeah, yeah. Both the manifestors and the reflectors had the commonality, even though they're more rare than, Gemini than, than the generators by type, two thirds of the types were cosmos first. Mm. And so generators yeah. were the only ones that really connected to each other. And the generators didn't really connect much to the manifestors, didn't really connect much to the reflectors, because they're, I mean, Ra like to say, those you know, reflectors are on the moon. They're feeling mm. the transits from the cosmos primarily. And then they notice you, and they might amplify mm. you temporarily when you're in the room with them, mm. but then you leave, and they're not, care they're not holding on to any right. of your essence. They didn't retain the, you. The, yeah, the generator is deeply retaining. Well, now the projector comes along as a second type <laughs> that primarily connects to the other, a second relational type, we could say. And the most relational type. It only type connects to the other. Right. No one does? No, I said it only connects to Oh, it only does. Uh, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. I mean, no, I mean, of course it does. <laughs> yeah, only a manifester would say nobody really connects to the other. It's like, speak to yourself. Yeah. Or yourself. Yeah. And that's a fallacy also. But um, uh, manifestors can connect. I always look at, like what you were mentioning, Mike, you can look at the circuitry because, you know, there's more projected channels than any other channels, 26 right. of them. So, uh, uh, 22. No, I, think, yeah, I think it's 26. No, it's 26. It's, 20, all right. it, it's a lot. Somebody do the math out there. It's all right. Lot. Well, anyway, it's dominant by mm -hmm. far. And then you have your generated channels. You have your manifested channels. And whatever's open is reflective, mm -hmm. right? So we can all experience certain aspects of these things mm -hmm. at times. And that's where maybe the transits can come in or other people come in. But also, you know, if you have, a, you're a manifester and you have a projected channel that operates differently. I mean, it's, it, you're going to have bitterness. Okay, you might be angry that you're bitter, mm -hmm. but yeah. you're still going to have anger. You still have bitterness. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you share outer authority with somebody without informing them that you have something to share and they're okay with it, you're going to get a lot of negative feedback. Because it's not about you informing your choices. You're just sharing an opinion. And that needs to be recognized and invited as a projected element. If that's what is being accessed. Hmm. That's, you know, that's an important distinction to make for manifestors. Or any other type. You know, generators have a lot of uh, projected channels. They have certain aspects in their design that need to be recognized and invited. You know, it's... Per, per, Projectors aren't the only ones who need to be invited. It's interesting to me also that there's something really unique about the generator, which is that a generator must have at least one generated channel, but a manifester can have all projected channels. Projectors mm -hmm. obviously have all projected right. channels. Right, yeah. So there are these, there is, an, there is another difference there where the generator really does have something that's activated. consistent, yeah. that it, it doesn't depend on, on a lot of other things, other than if they're emotional, but and, you're still... Yeah. It's still the same life force energy that's consistent there. And it shows you the anger potential of any sacral gate, because if any of those sacral gates reach the throat, they become a manifesting generator, and anger becomes part of the signature, even if it's not the main mm -hmm. signature. That's a good point. Because well, that's what I mean about the universality of anger. It's because any motor has anger potential. And then plus it also depends on other factors in somebody's chart, you know, where, you know, depending... You know, you can be amplifying things from people, uh, uh, frequencies in the uh, cosmos. You're walking through a store and there's a lot of, you know, you just, somebody had one off and you don't even know it. That's still lingering in the air. Yeah, yeah, absorbing it from others. But I mean, yeah. I, I feel like I'm kind of a good example of this too, just because I have nothing hanging in any of the manifesting channels. Not, yeah, not, 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 even, not even the OG <laughs> one. I've got, I've got nothing in the pure manifesting channels. I've got nothing in the 3420. Nothing there. But you have 10. Oh, but I see, but it's still not. But I have so I have things hanging off of motors, and I can feel my contribution to manifestor anger if mm -hmm. that's made, whatever, electromagnetically mm -hmm. or through transit or whatever. Like, it, there is... Like, that, that's the whole thing about, like, how you get more rarefied, but you also get more universal when you go out to these types that are more rare, the, the manifestor and the reflector. Um it's almost like it's almost like that that so what okay so this is just a general question what makes a manifestor aura closed off where does the repellent come from 
comes in a can, twelve ounces <laughs> but, or sixteen. But how did how does that happen mechanically? What what is it about a motor to the throat and a lack of a sacral that makes someone right? Well, a anyone sword? who lacks the the sacral, we already know they're either going to be a projector, um, they're going to be a manifester or a reflector, mm-hmm. and so if if they have no life force energy at all, that puts them in a very special category of having a very Teflon, it's like a resistant aura. It's not mm. a repelling aura, but it's a very resistant aura. Mm. Um, I mean, it's a Teflon aura. Now we know that if you have at least one life force energy, but still no sacral de- definition, you're able to burrow into people and connect with them in a very deep way. Now we know that when, as soon as the motor connects to the throat, um, it, it's, it's an energized, powerful ability it's like the it's like the throat being this vortex out mm. in the world. Essentially, is creating this barrier so that it can push people out of the way, right. so that people get out of their way when they're going, and so that people, you know, it can replace people. It can. The throat I mean, is constant in a way. The throat yeah. is making something around itself, even regardless of whether the person is speaking or making anything. The throat is somehow making. Something. Yeah, the life force energy to the throat, when it has power behind it, because a projective channel to the throat that doesn't connect to a motor isn't, doesn't have that. It can't create an aura that's resistant, that, that's rather repelling. Right. It can't create a repelling aura. Mm. So, yeah, it's interesting to think about how that motorized throat creates a repelling aura unless it's counterbalanced by uh, the defined sacral, which is so powerful that it just envelops and pulls people in. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, I I have something I want to read, but I'd like for you to go on a little more about that. It is relevant. I I just have two axioms that came to me much earlier in this conversation, but we're kind of looping back to a little bit. Is like, one, the point of life, the point of... The point of life is waking up generators. Generators are the ones who are to be woken up. And the point of the body graph is the throat. Everything seeks the throat, right? And the thing that allows the throat to do what it does really is the sacral. And everything else helps. You know, the sacral is the life force. And the life force seeks the throat. It needs a pilot light lit sometimes. That's the root. It needs awareness applied to differentiate experience through the two awareness centers on the side. It needs to take care of itself through the heart. But like when you really, really zoom out and just see it as this purely impersonal way of just nature manifesting itself through differentiation, we know that everything seeks the throat and we know that the sacral is essential to life specifically because the difference between a cell and a rock is the sacral center, more or less, right? Yeah, and the throat being the center of manifestation. So right. The only portal the only, between the only inner, inner yeah. and outer. Well, and yeah. it makes sense that manifestors and reflectors, who are often their advisors, um, or, you know, they'd have kind of a court advisor um, in those days as well. Right. Um, you know, it's interesting that they needed to have a primary connection to the program and to the transits mm. so they could see what the program <laughs> wants so that they could get all the generator life force energy to right. help make that happen and get wow. them all kind of on on point. It's like they're they're connected. They're like, they have like one ear listening to the cosmos yeah. and then they're talking to the generator because the generator can't hear the cosmos. Yeah. The generator's hearing each other. Yes. And so the manifestors are kind of predominantly attuned to the cosmos. Well, well those are, do you have any comments on that real quick? Or? Well, I would just say that the the generator needs the some type of guidance in order to learn to slow down and and really wait in a way mm-hmm. to have the patience to wait and and I, and I can see where it if it's if it's conveyed in a certain way at the right time can really be beneficial for that generator really to get more aligned. They don't need a lot. That's the one thing that's great about generators. They don't really need a lot of alignment, so to speak, uh, to get their trajectory aligned. But they need to usually slow down, even well, regular generators. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. So, and, and especially manifesting generators. Something our friend Ray said the other night, which I really enjoyed, was he said he was, and he's a projector, but this very much applies to, to generators as well. Um, 
he was working a job where he had to do sales and he was having to call people all the time to make money. And if he didn't call them, he didn't make money. But he also had to answer the phone. And he was so annoyed about having to answer the phone. And he said, he complained to his boss, I'm being constantly interrupted. And his boss said, I made a million dollars by loving being interrupted. Whoa. <laughs> but that's a generator thing. I mean, I don't think it's good for projectors to have that kind of role where they have to constantly be available to answer the phone. Mm. I mean, I think it's it's much nicer. Well, it depends. Uh, There's it another deficient. way of looking at that since I've been in yeah. the phone room business. Um, generator can respond. Sometimes it's easier than initiating and trying to make a call. That mm -hmm. if they, could, if they uh, respond, they have a way of then being able to deal with the other in a way that might be more satisfying than trying to initiate. Well, it is Manifested yeah. generators might have a little better chance of D dialing people than uh, a regular generator usually. But, but even this whole um, trope of being annoyed of being interrupted or don't interrupt me or anything like that is just life interrupts, okay? Mm. Like, it's not really an interruption if you're in a flow. And then mm. it's just the new, you're catching every ball that comes right. to you. I, I, when I was, I, yeah. I often use this, this example of, you know, well, actually, Ra's favorite first example of a generator was a tennis player. It was a famous tennis player, and he would use her chart and show how the the ideal, the exalted generator is just the ball comes, hit it. The ball comes, hit it. The ball mm -hmm. comes, hit it. That's the best thing for the generator. And is the ball interrupting? No, they're ready to hit it because they're waiting to hit it. Mm -hmm. yeah, if sure. you're waiting to answer the phone. I'm not sure this uh, interruption uh, thing you mentioned. I'm, uh. Well, yeah, maybe you can kind of you know think about it a bit, but it's because it's not really an interruption. I mean, is the tennis ball coming at the tennis player? No, I understand that. Yeah. No, I I tell people to use uh, certain things like generators who are in athletics or something, and to maybe doing some kind of martial arts training or do things like jujitsu or other things where you can respond or judo or any kind of uh, instead of being the initial to react learn how to counter react to respond as a natural way of mm -hmm. of aligning your body if you were going to do something like that instead of trying to make it happen yeah i mean you don't See, want it's to have like your, that kind right. of that dichotomy like you don't want to be an initiator boxer you want to be a counter puncher mm -hmm. in a sense and so I, I can see your point that if you're playing tennis, you don't want your phone ringing all the time. I mean, there's there's levels of it. But yeah, I'm not sure yeah. about the interruption thing about generators. I'm I'm not, I don't know what that. I well, don't know why they would have a problem with that. Hmm. Yeah, I guess my only point is that people can get so stuck in their idea of what it's supposed to be that life is coming at them. Oh yeah. And they're getting more and more annoyed because their mind is saying it's not really even frustration. See, we have to differentiate between what is the frustration where the mind is forcing the body to do something it didn't respond to for mm. a generator mm. versus what is what is the annoyance of the mind going, this isn't what I expected. Mm. You know, this doesn't match my expectations. Of, well, this of is reality. also where you get into the conundrum of someone not being um, mentally prepared to deal with life. Um, one thing that the mechanics do teach is that you can see how the life operates, right? So... It, it's it's not personal in nature. See, what happens with a lot of people get frustrated is they have an expectation and a belief that it should be a certain way. When it doesn't, it creates a mental dilemma and because it's all based on a belief. Mm. So when you understand the mechanics and how it works, it takes away everything personal. It takes away the expectation that something should be something. And then it allows life to just show up as it does. As long as you, as a generator, respond to it correctly, you get the correct experience. You know, so that's what we'll give you. If you can surrender to that and you, and you know that you're entering things correctly because you have that satisfaction, that's the signature that you need. Mm. Or the not-self-signature that shows frustration. You know, so that, that is something that, you know, you look at and you have to gauge with the mind, it does need to be healed in a way, but it's the way that the generator is going to most benefit is always through their response, you know, listening to the response and understanding that nothing's personal. You know, mm. it's just mechanics. Mm. That, to me, would that's what helps because then they're not so, so in themselves that they can see a little more um, bigger picture. Mm -hmm. To see a little outside themselves. Just enough mm -hmm. to make a difference inside themselves. 
Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Any comments? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of comments because this kind of segues back to like the 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 initiatory thing I wanted to frame this discussion around too, which was the sixty three transit and how um, and how you know Pluto's about to leave the sixty and how I've been hearing all these conversations, Jonah, yours included, at one of the last catalysts about initiating right before the moment. Right, you told you told that story about Vaughn. Right, or I, yeah, it was kind of one of the tropes from Ra as well that a generator who doesn't enter into something correctly doesn't have the staying power to persevere, and so when it gets rough, they initiate to quit yeah. right yeah. before the change would have come. Right, 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 and that holding, like we see that sixty to three channel is such like a, a, a elementary like generator channel, and how much it demonstrates that like the endurance of boredom the endurance of routine the endurance of yeah. the same hoping that something will change and that pre and that's known to be like maybe the most pressureful root channel that there is you know that that 60 to 3 channel but there is again also being called the channel of mutation there's something universal about that there's something universal about the idea of mutation and that mutation really does happen when you don't give in right before the crisis right before the thing that actually births something new mm. that actually really radically changes something whole, like um su sustaining there's something very human too about about endurance and we see that in the human experiential way um and yeah, that just could be you know with the 360 that as a background frequency in the program well people are going to be dealing with that potential thematic mm. in some way or another Mm. To what degree, who knows? Some more than others. Mm. But, you know, it is it is a, a format game, a channel. Right. So, it, you know, if you have that or in there, it accentuates individualism. Right. You know, where does the individual want something new? You know, a new, do you want some, you know, there can be a pressure to really begin, I, you know, something, mm -hmm. I need change, mm -hmm. you know. So do people then act from a mental place to create the change? Or is that their experience going to be? Whether they have choice in that or not, it doesn't matter. You know, mm. that's whether they're going to experience it, or does somebody use that uh, use that energy, and it's being used correctly, unbeknownst to them, and it's in, it's empowering some type of thing that is beneficial. It can push through something. And what's extremely interesting about that channel is that only humans have it but then single-celled organisms have half of it. Yeah. And nothing else has half of it. So human cells have at least part of it. But not mammals, not... N birds, nothing else. No, and that tells yeah. you a lot when not you want to look sure. at charts. Look at the different types of charts. Look what's... Or circuits or anything. Look what's not included. Right. It tells you a lot. Right. And as Jonah says, it's like what is what is there on the body graph is what's configurable. What is able to be taken to a degree of differentiation sure so it's like the cell can differentiate its difficulty at the beginning yes right it can differentiate how it responds to the pressure of limitation mm -hmm. the limitation is homogenous for the cell not so for the human we can differentiate the limitation and the difficulty at the beginning the thing how we respond to the limitation but the, what the cell can differentiate only is that response like only like things are the same, things are the same. Oh, something's different now. Different. I can do something with it. Something is different. I can do something different now as a piece in a broader structure. Obviously, it has no awareness. It has no awareness gates, whatever. It's just unfolding. It, what it has is a channel of rhythm, which unfolds a logical pattern. It starts to build mm -hmm. more and more elaborate vehicles for consciousness and life to enter. And it's only the human that can differentiate every step of that process, but only the cell is available to the pressure to do some to diverge evolutionarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I have two comments. Just as we were mentioning the human experiential way, mm -hmm. uh, which is from gate forty-one to thirty, and then from thirty-six to thirty-five. The first is that's a manifester. Oh, so yeah. it's interesting. That's so true. People ask, <laughs> yep. why is everyone conditioned to be a manifester? <laughs> yeah. Why does everyone think they need to be a manifester? Why That's is everyone, well, fuck, well yeah. you're a human, and the human experiential way is a manifester. So yeah. everyone kind of has that conditioning. The second point was the keynoting of Steve Rhodes, where he keynotes 
the root as endurance. Yeah. And it's funny because when I first read that, I thought, wouldn't endurance be kind of like gate 21, like stamina, sustaining mm. or something like that? But Fuck I actually, no. <laughs> well, okay, but I actually like the keynoting of endurance because you used that word many times. Mm. And we were talking about the endurance of the sacral. He keynotes that as service. Mm. And so, yeah, it's... There is an endurance aspect because the three format channels, which are very powerful channels, mm. go from the root to the sacral. Mm. But there's also the endurance that's part of humanity. That's mm. the endurance to try to get the experience. Mm. Or the keynoting he uses for the solar plexus is feeling. To feel something new or feel something different. To endure um, life until something different comes along. Mm. Or to just hang in there until you get to have a new experience. That's, that's kind of 4130 is part of endurance waiting to feel something new and different. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we have two other routes to solar plexus channels as well. Those three, using his keynoting, could all be seen as ways in which we endure life. To, or we, He describes endurance also as trying again over and over and over again. Right. And he kind of says there's really only three things the program says is worth trying over and over and over again. It's not really worth trying over and over and over again to get your desires met. He keynotes ego's desire. Mm. It's not really worth trying over and over again to share something. You try to share it doesn't work, that's the throat sharing, mm. you know. He he says, eh, it doesn't work, you, you don't do it, you know. But it's worth trying to succeed, the spleen. Mm -hmm. It's worth trying over and over to serve, the sacral. And it's worth trying to feel different than how you feel. If you feel bad, it's worth trying to feel good. Mm -hmm. Or if you feel bored, it's worth trying to feel excited. Mm -hmm. If you feel pain, it's worth trying to feel hope. You know, basically striving, the, the striving or enduring is, is in the root. So that was just another side point, too, of that. Um, it's interesting to see, uh, you know, we were talking a lot about endurance and enduring of the you know, limitations of gate 60, but... Well, endurance yeah. in the root, and I don't necessarily see Steve Roth's point on that, but... Um, the endurance of the root is, you know, the pr you're dealing with the pressures of the world when you're dealing with the root center. Mm -hmm. That's really like where, you know, you you're dealing with the the, the working world, the pressure to, to be in the world, mm -hmm. all those pressure gates coming out of the the root center. Um, whether you have it defined or undefined, how you're going to deal with it differently. Um, you know, someone who has a defined has a consistency to that, and undefined they don't. Um, they potentially can be the most pressured, um, and. I think endurance is a is a good word because that's also part of the channel struggle. is It really is about endurance. Mm -hmm. It's a really it's something a very resilient re, re, endurance that you need. But to perfect, you know, to provoke, uh, to tr uh, transform the transformation of the tribe. There's an endurance factor in all those. Mm -hmm. All the, the format channels. There's an endurance. Factor. Everything has a certain endurance factor coming mm -hmm. out of the root. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, especially on the uh, emotional side because endurance can come in a wave. So you're not feeling it. You're not. You're not feeling it. You're not feeling it. You're feeling it. You're not feeling it. Feeling it. Mm -hmm. You know, and and sometimes you have to endure yeah. that. You have to endure the wave often. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I, it's when a good you have it to see where it goes. So it's an interesting question to me that if someone has an undefined root, are they really not designed, you know, they try something, it doesn't work, are they designed to just try something else instead of just mm. keep trying the same thing over and over The thing, yeah, the thing with trying to me, um, it's not about doing and doing. I mean, whatever, whatever life will bring to you and you do, you do, but it's not necessarily about, um, thinking you need to try to be the other thing. You, you know, if you operate correctly, you'll become whatever that is. And it could be better than what you think you need to try to be. So I, I think sometimes the words, uh, you know, Steve uh, Rhodes does get a little too mind, sorry Steve, but uh, a little too mindy for me is because it's not about... Um, any of these shoulds, because there's no shoulds. So, and I'm not sure if he's saying that necessarily. Uh, it was kind of paraphrased that way, but um, it's really about whether you enter it correctly or not, and then you get the right experience. Yeah, his, his way of explaining it is really if you have channels between two centers, those are kind of 
Like in my case, I have the root connected to the sacral through 952. Mm -hmm. um, I'm designed then to, even in my true self, no matter how much deconditioning I do, to try again and again and again to serve. To just continually endure in order to serve. Mm -hmm. Using his keynoting. Mm -hmm. Someone who doesn't have a defined root or a sacral, or they, they have a defined sacral but not a root, maybe they're not, you know, as not self, they're going to be trying even harder than I am. Mm -hmm. And they're going to but be see, what trying. You, I, my know, question is: yeah. Are you needing to try? It's just, it's just what happens. If that's true, if he says what happens is actually happening, it's not about trying. It will just come to fruition. Yeah, my, and my look point like is, whatever it will come to. I yeah. guess my point is that the deconditioning is very different for someone with depending on what centers there are. So obviously, deconditioning an undefined root. It's an interesting lens to to see it as maybe deconditioning the undefined root. They stop trying so hard, they stop hitting their head on the same wall. Maybe I decondition, I keep hitting my head on that same wall because mm -hmm. I'm designed to hit my head on the wall until the wall breaks. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, for me, I'm an undefined root with my mm -hmm. son Earth in, mm -hmm. uh, in 39 and 38, respectively. Mm -hmm. And dealing with that in the pressures in the world was very difficult. Also, being right minded and a male projector in this world and uh, wired to be more of a manifesto than a generator, even though I have a hanging 14, can make me a super slave. But, um, and I have been both. It, it To me, the undefined root and dealing with all the pressures is can be quite um, overwhelming at times, in my experience, and with other people. Actually, Ross said, if he had to guess which group of people uh, were uh, victims of suicide, whatever, they, they, they ended their life through suicide. He would say most of them would have an open root would be his take. Not that, wow. he, did a, not that he did a study mm -hmm. on it mm -hmm. or anything, just because of dealing with that. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I'm a third line, three, five. Mm -hmm. And there were times where I thought, man, this freaking life sucks, mm -hmm. you know, in the past. You, you don't and, want to try anymore. But yeah. it wasn't, I never came to the point where I was going to try, but it wasn't, I just learned to deal with the pressures because I learned of what I over time, I learned what it meant to be me as a projector mm. and my mechanics. And like, um, my son has a defined root. Um, um, he is the 3254. And um, he deals with pressure differently. He has a consistent way of dealing with pressure that I noticed that's different from me. But uh, he, didn't, he didn't have that... He has other pressures that came in, like his open ego. But he's dealt with that, and so it's a, it's it's a opportunity when you have something open to really be a witness to it eventually, to mm -hmm. be wise about it. Mm -hmm. But you have to go through a lot, I think, as a conditioned adult to get to a place where you can really be wise about it mm -hmm. and not have it run your life. Because mm -hmm. there would be all this pressure for me to get a job. All this pressure to make money, all this pressure to, you know, it's it, being in the world. It starts with the root pressure of being in the world. Mm -hmm. So either you have a consistent way of dealing with it, which could still be all screwed up because you're not self and other areas are dealing with that. Or you can have it undefined and other areas where they're all screwed up and you have this pressure that you're dealing with. Um, so there is an endurance in that. Now, I'm a third line, so there's a natural resiliency in third. Mm -hmm. So same with the channel of struggle. There's a born-in resiliency. Mm -hmm. So I think life in, in the root center with all that pressure, there is this level of endurance that has to be there. Mm -hmm. Has to be there. Or the mutations wouldn't be able to take place. Mm -hmm. Or the other things that change in the world wouldn't be able to take place if we couldn't endure. Right. And we all just said, fuck it. Yeah. And blow our brains out. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like the sacral center is like the candle. You light it and it's just... Yeah, it's, 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 it's sustainment. And it keeps going. And, and then keeps... everything else works off of that. But the lighting is the root. Yeah. And like if the candle does go out, the root has to light it. And that's why the format channels are so important. And they rule the chart when they have them. They play, you know, whatever it's collective logic or individual... Or collective abstract, they're gonna they're gonna put an overall theme on a on a chart, big mm. time. Mm. 
Yeah. You right. know, just like the centering circuit does too. Mm -hmm. Makes you more individual. So these things are always, you have to layer them in, new, in nuance when you're looking at somebody's design. Yeah. It, it configures the instantiation of the life force in the world through yeah. the format channels. Yeah. Yeah, and we have, uh, so Amy, who I That's think, a great lecture if anyone wants to listen to the <laughs> format channels. Just putting it out there. Well, and I was going to say, she has the same format channel I have, which is the 952. Ooh, ooh, you <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for being here, Amy, and you're so quiet. Uh, do you have any thoughts about what we've been talking no, about? No, I'm just absorbing well you're a generator so you're it's good to just just absorb just take it in but she has the 952 that i have as well so uh really good at concentrating really good mm. in stillness really good at focusing yeah. yeah but um well i in a moment i want to read something about manifestors go back to our earlier conversation because i thought it was really interesting mm. um but just to kind of last point about steve rhodes keynoting um he just puts these one word keynotes to the centers and then the way he plays with them is by looking at the channels as alternative, almost competing ways of trying to achieve that in the world. So the route mm -hmm. to the solar plexus is endurance to feeling, or really trying again and again, kind of trying, if it doesn't work, try again, if it doesn't work, mm -hmm. try again, if it doesn't work, try again. Well, there's three ways to try again to achieve that feeling mm -hmm. of, of solar plexus. Um, success, he puts on the splenic side, there's three competing ways of trying to succeed, mm -hmm. you know, tr trying to get that success through purpose, trying to get that success through logical improvement, or trying to get that material success. Um, and so, and then, you know, and the, and the same with the three formats going to the sacral. Now what's interesting is, the root doesn't connect to the G center, mm -hmm. which he keynotes as love. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't work with love, it's not worth trying again. You have people mm -hmm. trying to make love work, trying to feel in love again. Where did the love go? The love is gone. I'm going to try again and again. No, mm -hmm. there's no energy for that. Mm -hmm. what, what can you really do with love? Well, the sacral connects to it. That's service. You can serve love. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can be of service to love, be of service to the people you love, be of service to the things you love. If you're a generator anyway, you're designed to serve love. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, what, the G-Center connects... Um, to the spleen, so there's success. You can succeed with love. You can have the love of success. You can play with the keynotes here. The ego, he keynotes as desire. So desire and love, you know, where do those meet? That's in a channel you have, that 20, 25, uh, 51, exactly. And then finally, the throat, which is sharing. And so love can be shared. Mm. And you can share what you love with the world. And so people like Mike, who has that um, channel of the alpha, can share share love with the world share direction i guess as well as so long as he's invited recognize him invited. <laughs> yeah exactly but yeah but you know but i go back i this just my cross attention can't I, my body can't stop doing what it wants to do yeah um the the only thing with I, I can appreciate his uh his summation of a singular word to describe the center of what its purpose my my hang up when I'm listening, is the trying aspect. Like, people are mm. trying to do that. To me, that's encapsulating how this frequencies work on a not-self, seven-centered level. And not how it just truly emanates as self. Which it still can, the way he's describing, but it's the way... Because when you're saying you're trying to do this and you're trying to do that... That engage, it's, it's a lot of the mind consciously choosing that I need to do this. Or is it just something that's being done? You know, is he making the distinction of it being something consciously aware of? Or are you and making those choices from that conscious awareness? Or, or is this just a byproduct of what this is? And then that's what you, you get to experience. Now, to what degree is self versus not self? That's another story because that always changes, even with definition mm -hmm. and a regular person, a regular chart with regular terminology. Well, I've got a question for you. This is a piece of keynoting that's been in my practice for so long. I don't remember where it came from, maybe from Jonah, but that every channel is an obligation. That. A, you know, a channel is certainly a limitation. You have it. The reason it's an obligation is because you kind of have to embody it in your life. To you have no choice. You have no choice. Well, you have no choice in so, anything. But yeah, so you certainly have no choice. So in when that. you get into the territory of no choice and obligation, it's really easy for the word "should" to come in there in a non-mental way. 
because it's the sh- again it's sort of the natural should. It's the yeah, should generators in, should wait well, to respond. This is projectors the should wait to be the invited. These are yeah. these are it it it. I would say it could behoove a generator to wait. <laughs> <and> <laughs> That's a little technical. <laughs> Fine, um, but, but I, you I, should I, stop I, at a trying, stop sign. But trying yeah. trying is failing. All right, you know. Do or do not. Try. There's no try. Well, okay, so here's another word that comes up in my practice all the time. <laughs> Contrivance. If it's contrived, then it's mind, right? Yeah. If it's if it's in any way fabricated, if it's in any, any way, way manipulated, any way cons- yeah, then it's always going to be yeah. it's coerced in right, some right, way, right. manipulated. Yeah. But the form can strive, as we've seen in our discussion of the root. The form can strive. The form can make an attempt. And that's not really a try in the same way that there's a mental. No, try. if it's it's a natural byproduct right. of what's unfolding, mechanically speaking. You're right. You know, if that gives you sharing your love from the G to the throat, right. and that's what you're doing, mm-hmm. fine. It's that's not because you're trying; it's just because who you are. Right, 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 right. That's what you do because yes. it's part of your mechanics. Right, right, right. You're not trying <laughs> yeah. to do that; you are that. It's almost or like, not. It's almost like trying versus trying to try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could try and touch that table. <laughs> yeah. Try and touch okay. it. Okay. <laughs> no, you touched it. You didn't there try. You go. Yeah. I watched myself do it. Yeah. You something something it. tried to do it and succeeded. I was, yes, for I, those, I was witness to that. For those visually challenged in this experiment, he did tap the table. <laughs> well, okay. Well, how about this? How about this? Experiment. We're, this is an experiment. I don't say experiment. How can you have an experiment without something trying to do something? I don't say experiment. You don't you say experiment? Yeah. I say experience. You say experience. Uh, yeah. Okay. I say experience because I don't... Who's experiment? That's the right variable there. The experiment is on the screen. Who's, who's okay. experimenting? The solar plexus. Well, See, it's, no. a, it's a nice way to get the, the not-self mind introduced to human design to get them to the point where they f- might finally understand there's actually no choice. Right. Because it's about, Ra had to talk to the not-self. Yeah, okay. So it. everything was yeah, geared yeah. a lot with thinking that you really had choices. Right, right, right. Right? This is what's happening, really. This is what's, yeah. ha- this is what's happening. Get this is what's program. unfolding. Yeah. <laughs> you don't really have a choice. Yeah. Right? But he's thinking, oh, you, I, don't listen to me. You can see and experiment yourself. Mm. But they're already shown yeah. that you can consciously choose something. They'll test it. And know that you consciously chose that mm-hmm. six to nine seconds, six to nine seconds prior to you consciously choosing it. Right, right, right. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. We said that. I said that before. It's I think the last. Yeah. So it's like, who's choosing? Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I even say on um, just a purely mundane level, choice is uh, no choice. Right. Just from the byproduct of being conditioned and your genetics. Yeah. You know, now you throw in trajectory and all this cosmic stuff. Right. And, you know, the program, you know, all this stuff. Then you're you're looking at a totally different way of seeing that there is no choice. Right. It's for the experience. Because if it was an experimenter, who's, where's the control group? Who's controlling it? Are you actually, con- you know, yeah. are you, who's doing the manipulation of the, of the testing right. to validate, you know, to, to, to see if the experiment is working or not. Mm-hmm. And even if it's not working, does that mean it doesn't work? Because it's not here to work for everybody. Because we're all here to have a different experience on that platform. That's why most people never hear about human design. Mm-hmm. It's 4% of 4%, and I think that's generous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be 12 million people. At the uh, yeah, it could be. <laughs> yeah, it could be, but to what degree? Right, right now it's like 5,000 people. Yeah. What Plus a million on TikTok. Yeah. So. yeah, but to what degree though? How far are they going to take it? To what yeah, are yeah, they yeah. going to get to the place where? As it what do they know like, about design? This and that. Are they going to actually get to the place where they're living correctly, right. or not? Yeah. Okay. Well, I have something interesting uh, uh, that I want to read, mm. which is about manifestors. Um, and Love me, manifestors. And just as a yeah, as a preface, I'll just say there was an interesting conversation on TikTok about uh, two weeks ago now. Um, Thanks to Casey Daly for bringing it to my attention. And I, I chimed in a little bit, um, but it was basically somebody who's kind of new to human design, who has a huge astrology following, was saying that the manifesting generator is actually a type of manifester, not a type of generator. And that everybody's gotten it wrong, Uh-oh. that their, their auras are more like the manifester. Now, there were some inaccuracies in what this person was saying. For one thing, was saying that to be a manifester, you have to have a manifester channel. 
It's not true. Not true. Ra did not have a manifested channel. He uh, he only had projected channels, or you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but he but obviously to be a manifester is when um, when channels connect the. A, any, any motor any other, motor than, the other than the sacral, yeah. So mm -hmm. any of the three motors, either the root, the ego, yeah. or the solar plexus, mm -hmm. to the throat, um, and they could be through manifested channels, but they could also be through projected channels. Mm -hmm. uh, but besides that, she was just trying to argue that the lived life experience of the manifesting generator is much more similar to the manifester, and uh, I disagree. And I, I think Genoa, yeah, well, Genoa, I would disagree too. Yeah, I think most people do. So, um, <laughs> but but there, but you'd be amazed because all the comments agreed. They were all manifesting generators, going like, "Wow, you're so right. I can't believe all these people telling us not and, to initiate." And and really, many, we're here. And to where initiate. are they in their process? And they where just they found know? out about human design. Yeah, minutes of ago. course, that's the yeah. people who so normally there, have the most adverse. There are people who heard about human no design and were anything. told you're yeah. not here to initiate. And went, "What yeah. the hell? I'm not here to initiate. You've got it wrong. You know, I'm a manifesting generator. I'm here to initiate." Right. So in any case, I just want to read Manifestors by Genoa Oblivion. This is a short, short piece. Okay. Then I want to open it up to, co to talk about. Mm -hmm. And as we're talking about it also, I don't really want to... The, the, the preface about the manifesting generators, I actually am more interested in what we were talking about earlier as the projector role of... The projector's role as the replacement for the manifestor, so to speak, mm -hmm. and how different this is. Uh, how different manifestors are from projectors, not mm. just generators. Because you'll see when we start, I mean, s there are some commonalities, there are also some differences. Mm -hmm. So I'll try to read the whole thing through, because I think it'll be useful. Um, there are some interesting points that I wanted to make. Like, he mentions that manifestors interfacing with others can be really exhausting. Well, I'm sure it can be exhausting for projectors too, but projectors are kind of here to interface with others well, the others. right others right yeah. exactly and then i was thinking manifesting generators they're not exhausted from yeah. interfacing with others at all so anyway okay i'll just read it and then we can open no, up the conversation exactly and, they're yeah. not and i and I, I'm totally, i'd love to hear your ideas as, as well amy if you have any comments sure. on this so okay yes amy. Um, mg representation and the yeah building. since you are <laughs> manifesting generators i'd love to hear your and i you know okay genoa blyvin Manifestors naturally do things that are original. Everything else is a hassle. The hassle aspect stems from the fact that energy is a precious commodity for manifestors. They use it up quickly doing things with great intensity. It is rare for them to be able to receive energy from others. So they need to rest and have a great big break from everything and everyone to be healthy. Manifestors can feel put upon by nearly everything or anything. Interfacing with others is exhausting. Convention is exhausting and exasperating. Repetition is numbing. Everything must be efficient or the energy will run out before it is complete. Nearly every interaction steals their fire and their originality. Yikes, I'm painting a dismal picture, but I thought that you might like to know. The only thing that matters to a manifester is that one original thing that will come out of them that is a game changer. It will change the world in some small but totally amazing way. Everything else is just maintaining, 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 boring and depressing. Mm. If a manifester is helping you, it is because they want to totally rock your world and turn it into something totally else, to completely remake your world. If they do this, you may feel that you are dying. It can be almost unbelievably disorienting. Mm. Manifestors are strong medicine meant to be taken in small doses. It may be hard to imagine this kind of reality, but your manifestor brothers and sisters live in that place. They only want to strike like lightning and withdraw. When they withdraw, they push off and impact you. They impact by leaving. They are always leaving, mm -hmm. even when they are being there for you. Even while talking to you, they are leaving, trying to make their point so they will never have to make it again. At the same time, manifestor children are the most tender beings imaginable gentle beyond thought or breath. They need protection because they are so alone. There is no connection to anyone for them unless this connection is totally without expectation. Imagine for a moment what this might be like, to live like this, to be a child and to be so alone. They are totally alone except for you. When you are with them, you feel alone too. Alone on the edge of a planet that has virtually no living being upon it. You like, the, you, like them, become the exception to the rule. It's a freaky feeling, is it not? Like there's no one else? No one. They are a being who is so ancient, yet nothing they are doing has ever been done before. 
Even if they are doing what you just did, it has never been done before. Mm. They are remaking the world in every second. It is weird and inspiring, but weird nonetheless. You can feel how powerful life is when you are just observing it as though it is happening to someone else. The manifestor child will stand on the edge of the play in the socializing of the others. They do not need to participate to feel totally involved, overwhelmingly involved. The world and social interactions seem huge and powerful. The manifestor child is alienated. They are alien. They are tender and vulnerable and cannot join in, not in the same way as others. They feel so close and alone at the same time. They just need your simple understanding of these simple facts. They came to Earth to change the world. Change is scary. It is stressful. It is stressful for everyone, even manifestors, especially for manifestors. They are hanging on to their humanity with the tiniest little thread. You can just stand next to them and hold it with them. You need to be so very subtle. Never place an expectation on them of any kind and you will be their friend for life. Such behavior is so rare. Manifestors get hardened through the expectations of others. No one suffers more because of this hardening than manifestors themselves. Manifestors are naturally tender. Let's do what we can to keep them that way. Ironically, it is through doing nothing that they will feel closest to you. They can feel close to you from a vast distance, even when they are standing right next to you. Mm. This vast distance is so important to give them because through it, they will be close. So close, you can hardly believe it is possible. Mm. Closer than your own breath, your own thoughts. This is the secret of manifestors. You give them space, lots of it, and they will come close to you and love you forever. Right. It's like that junkyard dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Genoa, for that, for that wonderful understanding of manifestors. So, yeah, I mean, my point in reading this, I mean, any thoughts, first of all? Any for me, yeah, anyone. Yeah. I have tried initiating, so I can get things done as a manifesting generator quickly. Most of my life, probably before I knew anything about human design, I was responding. I was in my living a design. When the points of my life that I decided that I wanted to initiate and make things happen because of programming or on, like trying to make a business or. Um, I hit walls everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And when I learned about my human design and I stopped trying. Like, it's a relief. It's mm. such a relief. It's mm. so easy. Well, and, and hearing, and hearing that, and well, that description of the manifester, though, I mean, that is so different from the manifesting generator, right? I mean, you don't feel alien to me. I mean, when we hang out, it's like, right, we're yeah. just like two peas in a pod. I mean, that's how it feels <laughs> with generators. It's like we're all giving each other big hugs and bouncing around. And yeah, for sure. I identify a lot with a manifester on a lot of levels. I think as a projector and a manifester as non sacral beings, we are always on the outside looking in anyway. Like, if we go to a party, they're the ones that are going to end up on the outside. And but the projector that's one-on-one -on -one will burrow so deeply into the other person. That if they have the one-on-one -on -one opportunity. Mm. That's yeah. not always there. Mm -hmm. So, depending on the crowd or whatever. But it's it, both the manifester and the projector usually end up on the outside. They're not, one, they're not part of the main group, usually. Mm. Uh, at least not for extended period of time. You know, it would always fade out that way. That's a natural thing. And the isolation, you can feel very alien. Now, they feel alien in a different way than I would, but there's still an alien type thing that the generator doesn't necessarily feel at the depth of. Not to say that they don't feel alien at times, because there's a, a lot of generators are individually uh, designed, and individuals can feel very mm. um, alien. Mm. So... And also that circuitry, depending on them, how the manifest is wired, or that can make all, or the projector or a generator can all make a difference in how this all plays out. But I, I do feel that you do give them the space, like Genoa mentioned. I think that's, and then they they can be close. It's like they need their freedom. Mm -hmm. They have to have their freedom, even if, you know. They're not free. They are free, but they're not free because they're doing something. It's 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 just that that um, self awareness or their perspective of the situation, or just the situation itself. The frequency of it allows them to be this impactful person 
as long as they're not being manipulated or coerced or constricted. Mm. So I think that's important. They need to be, they need to allow themselves to, they need to be them. Mm. They, they need to be an individual even more so than some other people. Because well, what, what, they're not made for the yeah. group really at all. I mean, Whereas a projector could be in charge of a group, generators of groups, yeah, they, but there manifestors are, penta, are not really there for that. There are manifestors that have penta channels. I mean, there can be, but even in that case, yeah, I, I think they Type overrides right. it. Right, and well, and what I was noticing about it was just for projectors, like, in, like a projector who says interfacing with others, you know, I, I don't want to have to interface, even the way of talking about it. Like, mm. it's so cold and callous and uncaring and un inhuman in certain mm. ways that, um, you know, it's almost like a little bit like um, in that scene in uh, There Will Be Blood where uh, Daniel Day-Lewis's character is kind of sitting around the fire and he's saying, ah, I don't know what to do about all these people. <laughs> and the way he says people is like yeah. they're cockroaches, like they're just ants, like yeah. what are all these people around ah you know it's just this kind of scoffing i mean he's trying to be so sensitive but it's also it comes across really condescending in certain ways because he's saying you know um basically interfacing with others is exhausting all these people exhaust me mm. anyone placing any expectation whatsoever like yeah if you mm. say you're going to be there at nine i expect you to be there at nine ah don't expect anything from me it's so mm. exhausting how mm. you've expected me to do, even do one thing that you know it's a very grandiose kind of mm -hmm. pomposity that you that you get which i mean kudos for just laying it all out there and it's also very tender and very sweet and very touching mm. and very heartfelt and especially when you think about manifest your children who are going through i mean so it's but it's just kind of an interesting it's an interesting thing where when i think of projectors i could never imagine mike having that attitude mike has such deep empathy and if anything mike will have the opposite problem of getting in a nine hour conversation he can't get out of mm. you know projectors i had a, a you know projector girlfriend who loved that i would rescue her from conversations the two mm. things that she loved i would introduce her to someone and then leave so she could have one-on-one -on -one conversation with them she couldn't stand in other relationships she would be in a three or four way conversation because she'd be introduced but then somebody's monitoring her and watching her try to plug into somebody i would plug her into someone and leave mm. but then i would also keep one eye open and mm. my peripheral vision to see when she wanted out because she couldn't mm. get out of the conversation Trish. and i would come rescue her mm -hmm. from yep. when she was so deeply locked in and that plugged into somebody for a manifester, it's so different. I mean, they can leave anytime they want. They leave without saying goodbye. They just mm -hmm. walk off in the middle of a sentence. I've been having a conversation with the manifester. <laughs> They've just walked off. Mm -hmm. And I've been like, wait, what? And I turn and they're gone. I mean, it's very like Batman, you know? They have mm -hmm. a certain... So anyway, the, just some of my kind of initial... But I do see what you're saying is that all non sacral beings are going to be outside of the swarming mass of generators. Absolutely. And that is a swarming mass. So yeah. Yeah. And that's us. We're the swarming mass, Andy. Eh? <laughs> you know, I will say this is my... Um, Part of the show where I put the disclaimer out there, um, as always, uh, that you know a lot of these things that we're experiencing with manifestors, projectors, it's very different when it's predominantly self versus not self. Some, even the way you experience it, when the frequency is correct, there's not the the resistance that's created when it's incorrect with those same types of attributes. So, like, uh, if you have a manifester that's angry and not wanting to be there, it's very different than someone who's just seeing, I don't want to be here anymore, and I'm going. There's a difference in the, in the exit, the quality of the exit. Mm. Is it a peaceful mm -hmm. exit or an angry exit? Yeah. Well, and even... And that will create impact. And I will say that even though I said One that you know, Genoa's other. thing was a little bit... Um, you know, kind of had this certain air about it, but it, it was very peaceful. There was no anger. He's not like mad at the world no, he's a, that they've excluded him. He's a him. poet. He's at peace with the fact. <laughs> yeah, it's very poetic. Generous and, poet. And he's at peace with the fact that manifestors are going to feel this way. He's at peace with the fact people put the expectations on them and make them feel more alienated. He's kind of, it didn't come across angry. It came away very much at no, peace. You know, and most manifestors too, you, you know, they, I classify them as the entrepreneurial energy type hmm. they're 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 the kind of person that has to have something that they're doing that they want to have impact on right but they're already looking 
like like a defined will center, like kind of, they're already looking to get out in a way. They already they want to make their impact. Either they'll put someone else in charge, like if they made a business, and then or they'll sell it off, rest, and then start something else again. It's, or the monitor, you know, yeah. they they have the they 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 want to you know have this impact, but they get bored too. They don't want it. That's why the originality is yeah. also important. They, Not just one original idea, maybe, but for their for their life force, they they all right. This has been done. This is done. We've done this. I can put this in other. I can have impact in other ways mm -hmm. instead of staying with something. I can create something new again. But I need a rest. And, and they don't want to get stuck maintaining it and doing it day in, day no. out. And what's funny is I used to be very much like that in my mental imagination of myself as a manifester, spinning out companies, spinning out, start it yeah. up and get it going. Now I'm much more about what can I do every day for the rest of my life and be happy doing that. Yes. Because if I can actually really love the maintenance. I mean, I was in a, a program called Techstars, which is a startup accelerator. And a lot of it, as much as the world is not self out there, there are people who have wisdom and they've mm -hmm. usually achieved it very through a lot of difficulty and a lot of arduous effort and so on. And, you know, um, human design gives it to you with a lot less. You don't have to live a whole life to get the wisdom. You know, you can, uh, although ultimately we do because we all get wisdom through our openness, regardless of what that is. In Techstars, a lot of what they were doing was trying to stop all these generators from being manifestors mm. because all these people would come in wanting, and most of them would be generators and they'd be having this amazing vision. And the first thing they tell you at Techstars is you're here in spite of your ideas, not because of them. Cool. And they would say, it's going to take seven years to build your business. It was seven years, really, just like in human design. It's going to take seven years to build your business. You know, there are these amazing success stories. They probably were manifestors. The mm -hmm. rare ones who would spin out a company in 18 months or mm -hmm. two years or something like well, that. They had the serendipity but, of that life Yeah, path. exactly. Yeah. But they would really say, you, you know, do you really love your, your customer? Oh, you're making a service for restaurants? Do you love restaurant owners? And the owner would, and the, the business starter would go, what? Do I love these people? What are you talking about? Like, it's a bizarre <laughs> question. It's like, well, you're going to be serving them for the next seven years. Mm -hmm. You're serving your customer. And in order to serve your customer, you have to enjoy, it's like the, destina the, the journey, not the destination. And so many people came into the Startup Accelerator imagining the destination of we're going to be the next Twitter. We're going to be a $200 million company. We're going to sell off and be rich forever. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to have this impact on the world. We're going to change the world and then just laugh in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And that was the biggest deconditioning because we did have to go through basically a three-month boot camp of very intensive mentoring from people who had a tremendous amount of experience and a lot of their experience, you know, experience is the greatest teacher and it does ultimately teach you what human design as a practice gives you, which is the alignment to who you really are. Mm. That's what experience shows you is who you really are. You might well, have thought. It, well, it, it, it needs a context. But it can show you one way or another. Can, I mean, yeah, you know, well, yeah. For people most find people, out it's on going to show deathbed. you mostly you're yeah. not so. Well, they find out on their deathbed that who yeah. they really were is not who they lived but their how, life. Yeah, or, they, yeah. or you, you know, like when you get your initial reading, at least in my experience, like there was instances where I was recognized and invited and it was very successful that was far and few between yeah. but i knew what that felt like so when they mentioned that i can identify with it. but my life was predominantly not that mm. yeah you know what i mean it was filled with a lot of bitterness and a lot of frustration and anger and disappointment because that's the the, the world's not self-emotional state mm. that's out there and it's about you know, the square peg round hole syndrome, you know, so experience could tell you that, but if you don't have a context and a frame to put it in, it might not be as valuable in the long run. Not to say that you can't get wisdom from these places and things like that that could be beneficial, but the one great gift of human design, it gives it a context and a structure to see what that experience actually is telling you. Right, right. And, and my point was just that, you know, even the people who had the experience who were trying to impart it often couldn't 
because yeah. it was falling on deaf ears. So it's one of those kind of youth yeah. is wasted on the young kind of tropes where people end up learning who they really are and go, shit, I wish I would have learned this 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago. Mm. Well, that's what human design gives you is yourself without having to bark up the wrong tree your entire mm. life. Mm. Or um, the, even if it's the wrong tree, it was the correct wrong tree. <laughs> okay, well, okay, Zen master. This is the guru. This yeah. is, yeah, no, but no, this is the truth. <laughs> Okay, As a master, three five, yeah, yeah. you get ex you get you get ex good no choice. Though. If you're a third line, man, you're a third line. You get invited into something as a projector, and it's and it it's correct, but yeah. that shit ain't working right. Well, then you could see what shit ain't right, working right, right and yeah. uh, you know, and glean that the good correct way. mistakes to make. Good, yes. thing, good thing I was here to find the wrong tree. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because we, you know, so everything has a context. Yeah. That's why you know, we got to you know, break it down a little bit and, and, and see it in a certain type of lens. Mm -hmm. um, because it's, the world is so fascinating. But then again, there's a reason why this information came at this time. Yeah. You know, because the world is full of people who are not living correctly. Mm. And there still will be, because it's not going to reach everybody. Um, just, and that's not because some people were, it was chosen or anything like that. If you look at the, 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 what the voice said, the purpose of our existence was, was to contribute uh, self-reflected consciousness to, to, to a, the totality. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what experiences we have. Mm -hmm. Just some of us will have a human design experience, some more fully than others. Mm -hmm. And that just adds to the totality. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's no better or worse. It's just different. I don't know if that, that yeah. explains it, but I mean, it's kind of like, it, it is what it is. So, I mean, if you have the serendipity, as Rob would say, uh, of the of a life learning about human design and living as yourself, that, that brings, that's yeah. a totally different path than the vast majority of people right. who are listening, who are the other people in their life are not going to experience. Well, J Joni used the term accelerator for the startups, and human design's like an accelerator for mutations that can be carried to term, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mutations that can sustain, mutations that can... Because there, because Ra did leave a kind of question open about like the sustainability of the experiment of self-reflected consciousness in form, right? There was something kind of mysterious for him about that. He's like, he's apparently the voice didn't tell him whether it would succeed or not that it was an experiment in that sense too on the cosmic level yeah if there's an experiment it's on a cosmic level not on our level you know we're part of the experiment right. so to speak we're just mm. tools in the you know we're filters we're all filters filtering in experience based on our own specific software right well i've appreciated your filtering tonight mark on that note, let's let's call it. I think uh, we had some really good filtering. Thank you, Amy, for being our surprise guest. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for hosting. And uh, any final thoughts? Any? Uh... No, uh, just you know, great chatting with you guys. It's always nice, and it was nice speaking. Well, I'm, I'm glad you came back through Santa Fe, and uh, I hope to see you again soon. Yeah, where it was snowing today, people. Yeah, it is <laughs> snowing, and it is March 24th. Let's... Yeah, let's go south and get out of the cold. All right. He's hot thirst here. So. <laughs> All, All right. right. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. <laughs>